Amen. I love that song, and uh, that's a, that's one of them songs that's just a prayerful song. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you another challenge to take home today. Yeah. Try to sing that song every day. Yeah. Prayerfully sing it if you wake up every morning. May we ask the Lord every morning, just speak to my heart today. Speak to my heart as we open your word this morning, Lord. Lord, speak to my heart as I go to work. Speak to my heart as I raise our family. Speak to my heart as I do this or that. If we could just ask the Lord to speak to our heart, oh, would he not make a difference? I believe he would. I know, I know God's got something great for all of us, and uh, we're glad to have Archie and Miss Valerie with us today. I know the Lord's working in their life, and Brother Archie's faithfully following and uh, I enjoyed had some sit down time with him earlier this week and uh, we were just able to reminisce and talk about ministry and uh, and uh, he, he told me that the Lord had a message that he was working on him and I'd been kind of burdened about it being the end of the year and I always try to get back with the junior church and children's church one time at the end of the year uh, so I extended the opportunity to Brother Archie to bring in the message this morning and I'm looking forward to going back with the children's church. So, Brother Archie, if you will, please come and uh, share the share the message the Lord's laid on your heart. And uh, y'all be praying for him. And uh, just allow the Lord to, to speak and allow the, allow the Lord to move. Good to see everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord here today. It's an honor and a privilege come and speak for y'all today. Uh, didn't nobody know I was coming, except one or two, three, maybe. But uh, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. You know, when you're out and about, you never know what God will lay on your mind and your heart. And, uh, Brother Aaron's pretty much took the words out of my mouth there about uh, that song. We should let the Lord speak to our heart. And uh, I'll get geared up here in a minute. Uh, I've been out and about, and we, we, we've been around and stuff, and I heard a guy speaking on a passage pretty close to what I'm going to be on today. Is that going to be good, Andy? Can you hear me, Andy? But, like I said, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to be starting in verse 1, probably read through verses 4 or 5. If you are around and about, you hear a lot of questions arise in the church a lot of different questions about things you know uh, sometimes it's hard to answer some of them questions because I'm a firm believer we'll not know the answer to everything until we're face to face with Jesus but I know all of you sitting here today can look back in your life from where you've come to where you are now. When God took you and started, whatever how long ago it's been, you can look back today and you'll say, well, that was why. For some of you, y'all have never heard me or heard me, never seen me, but I guess I started coming to this church probably about 14 years ago. Andy wasn't much taller than AJ. That'd be about right, wouldn't it, Andy? Maybe a little bit taller, huh? <laughs> I love you, Andy. <laughs> but Andy might not have been that small. But the thing about it is, I question God why he brought me to this church. But I look back. I can see why. And, and, and like I said, we have a lot of questions that arouse up. 
I'm going to give you a good question that floats around the churches. What's the age of accountability? Well, I mean, you hear, you hear these questions floating around. Different, different, different. Uh, I heard a man one time, I'll just, I'll just tell you straight up. He said 12 years old. You couldn't change that man's mind. You could not change that man's mind. But let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and let's read verses 1 through 5. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one in thirty years. And he did, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high priest. Did I skip something there? Did I skip verse 2? Okay. I got lost there for a minute. But anyhow, from, uh, from Jerusalem, from the high priest, the grooves and that carved images and, and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Babylon uh, in his presence and uh, the images that were on high above them he cut down and the grooves and the craved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strew it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priest upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the rain. Lord, thank you for letting us be in your house here today. But most of all, I want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he came to this earth. And Lord, he laid his life down on that old rugged cross. But Lord, on that third day, he walked out of that tomb, and he was very much alive, and we know he's very much alive here today. Lord, I don't want any praise, honor, and glory for anything I say or do here today. I want all the praise and honor and glory to fall on you. Lord, thank you for everything you've given us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So I asked that question about the age of accountability. Well, that's not what I come to preach on. I've seen some of you raise up, and that's an interesting question. But what I come to preach on here today is revival. Revival. If I could name, or, or I'm going to title this, what I titled this sermon, Where Do You Stand? I'm going to come back to that later. But that's my question. Where do you stand? What is revival? We hear it floating around the churches a lot. You hear it, you hear it talking to people out in public. You hear it talking about at work. And people will say, the church needs revival. Well, that's really been laid on my heart and my mind for the last month or so. So, when we have people that, are, that have not given their life over to the Lord, and they say the church needs revival, they're looking at the church building. What we're going to do, come in here and paint the walls, put a new roof on, that's not reviving the church. And there's a, big, there's a big misconception out there of what the church is. The church is the people. The church is the people. It's us. How many of you have you ever heard the nation needs revival or our country needs revival? That's a question. You hear it a lot. So... I'm not coming here today, and my prayer was when I, when, I first, when I first knew I was coming, I had no idea what I was going to preach on. 
until 3.30, I mean, until 3 o'clock Tuesday morning. I'd been up and down just about all night. Finally closed my eyes and got just a little sleep, a little sleep and at 3 o'clock, my eyes popped open, and he said, this is what you're going to preach on. I said, yes, sir. There's different definitions for the word revival. If you look at a worldly, and I Googled this now, so surely it's correct, but it says, an, in, an important, no, excuse me, an, in, an improvement in the condition or the strength of something. Second definition and instances of something becoming popular, active, or important. Somewhat a little bit correct, but the biblical definition of revival is making alive again those who have been alive but fallen into what is called a cold or dead state. They are Christians and have left. Excuse me. And they are they are Christians and have life, but they are they need reviving to bring them back to their first love. So, where does revival begin? In us. It re it it begins in us. If we look at verse one. We see that Josiah was very young when he began his reign. You know, he took the reign at eight years old. How old is AJ, Andy? He's eight. So we got a kid that's eight years old. So you picture this. He took the reign to become a king to rule this country. Now, Bring what the people thought. Now, some of you may say, what's this got to do with revival? Well, when we get to the end of it and it all gets tied in with the Lord's work, we'll see what it has to do with revival. But we got to understand that revival starts in each and every person. There. Uh, sometime or another you don't have to flip over today but John chapter 1 verse 12 but has, but has uh, excuse me I missed a part here it says and some of, he's going, some of you may think say well he was a king he was already a king he was hired in to be a king but it uh, if you look over in verse uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 it says but as as many as received him to them uh, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name if you translate sons over it translates over to children of God if you give your heart to Jesus Christ and you know him as your personal savior you're a child of God you're a child of the Most High King. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, you're a child of God, but here's, here's, here's my thing. There ain't but one God. Some people may say or think other people are gods or whatever, but there's only one true living God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for each and every one of us today. But the church has come complacent. I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about the church as a whole body has come complacent. Why? We've got comfortable sitting on our pews. We don't want to go out door knocking. We don't want to tell our friends. We don't even want to tell our family. 
We don't want to tell our co-workers. And it's like this right here. When we become a child of God, it's our, our duty to pass it on. It's for us to go and tell. The disciples walked with Jesus, but after he was gone and he ascended back into heaven, what did they do? They went and told. Paul, what did he do? He denied Christ for years. But when God got a hold of him, he went and shared the gospel message. He's the one who brought it to the Gentiles, you and me. Now, we may not have never met him, but we met him through this right here, through the Holy Word, the Bible. But it's our duty to go out and share and tell people about Christ. As we also see in, in verse 1, he reigned for 31 years, a considerable time. I heard a guy give a sermon on this one time. He said this country, these countries had, had had revival for 30 years. If Lakewood Baptist Church would have revival for 30 years, and yes, Andy, I'll still be older than you, but I'll be 83 years old. Could you imagine what would go on in this community? Could you imagine what would go on in this county if this church had revival for 30 years? The walls would be full. There'd be standing room only in here. But we look at it, we look at it as, oh, it's not my responsibility. Wrong. It is our responsibility. It is our responsibility. And I guarantee you, each and every one of us, if you're born again Christian, that you've been around somebody and God's laid it on your heart to talk to that person. You may have or you may not have. But when we become a Christian, even before we get saved, that's the Holy Spirit tugging on our hearts. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes in us and He lives and He dwells within each and every one of us. He is our great comforter. Why? Jesus sent him to be with us, to help us. He's our helpmate. But we're afraid that people's going to make fun of us. I didn't look it up. It may not be the exact word for word for word, but Jesus said, if you deny me, I'll deny you in front of my Father. Let's look at verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. In verse 2. Let's read it again. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Plain and simple. We got a young man. We got a young man right here. Okay. Okay. Somewhere between the ages of 8 to 16, because it said he had reigned for 8 years. Somewhere in between there, or maybe it was close to the time he got 16. I don't know. But he started doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. He started walking with God. It also, it, 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 we can see it, it he, he must have reigned very well, approved himself to God. Now, let me say this. When we become a Christian, we don't become perfect. There's never been but one human being on this face of the earth that has ever become, that has been perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may say, well, why did you call him a human being? He was God. 
He was fully God, fully man. So when he was here on this earth, he was fully man. God didn't ask us to become perfect. He wants us to tell other people to win those souls to the kingdom of God. He didn't come. He didn't want anybody to perish. He didn't want anybody to go to hell. But if you reject him, you're sending your own self. He gives you the choice to accept him or reject him. We also see in verse 2, he walked in the way of David his father and de declined neither to the right nor to the left. He didn't turn to either side. When God puts us on a road, he wants us to walk straight. But it's easy because it's human nature for us to turn to the right or turn to the left. But when we fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ and we stay focused on him, we'll walk in the sight of the Lord. We'll walk straight. We don't go to the left. We don't go to the right. Like I said, human nature is easy to draw you off. But just like the song there a while ago, like Brother Aaron said, if we would use that every morning when we get up, our day would be a lot better. In verse 3, we see that he was 16 and began to seek after God. He was interested in what God had in store for him. Are you interested in what God's got in store for you? Then we got to seek him. See, here's the thing about it is. We say, well, I know him, I got saved. But, you know, the, the thing about it is, he wants you to know him. You understand what I'm saying? He wants you to know him. He wants, to know how, he wants you to know how much he loves you, cares for you. He wants to be your strength. He wants to know your smallest problem to your biggest problem. He wants to know your smallest care to your biggest care. He wants to know your burdens. He wants to know what you're going through. Now, some people would say, well, he needs to know me. He does, because he's all-knowing. The Bible plainly says he's all-knowing. He knows everything about you. He knows how many gray hair I've got on top of my head. My wife told me yesterday there wasn't nary one up there that wasn't gray. Now that disappointed me. Just wait, Andy, you got it coming. You know, but here's the thing about it is, he wants to know you on that personal relationship. He wants you to know him on that personal relationship. You say, how do I get that personal relationship? Right here. You also get a personal relationship by coming to church and being with other people. You feed off of one another. When you come to church, me and a guy I was having a talk about it the other day. When you come to church, you get recharged. You come on Sunday morning, you go out into the world on Monday morning, and what starts happening? You're like a battery. You start getting drained. If you come back on Wednesday night, you get recharged. If you don't come back until Sunday morning, you don't get charged to the following Sunday morning. But when you come on Sunday morning, then you leave this house, you got a good day, comes along on Monday. By the middle of the week, man, you just, oh, I don't wanna go to work, you know. And I'm not saying this just about going to work, but we don't wanna go out and tell other people about God because we hear of all the negativity outside. Then the negativity gets brought into the church. I'm not talking about only Lakewood Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church as a whole. But it's got to start somewhere. Where does it start with? It starts with us. 
But if you come back to church on Wednesday night, and there may be some reason you can't, I'm not here to beat anybody up. My prayer when I come, started praying to come to preach today, was I hope somebody took away that it lifted them up, not that they left and it felt like they'd been in a boxing match. I hope this message lifts you up. It lifted me up. It changed my it changed my look on some things when I had started studying on all this. And then when God brought it to my attention, what I was going to pray on, and I started studying it, I lifted myself up. But we feed off of each other. Negative feeds off of negative. Positive feeds off of positive. Are you seeking after God? Let's read verses 4 through 5 again. And it says, And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and uh, the images that were on high above them. He cut down the grooves and the carved images and the molten, molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them. He strewed them upon the graves of them. He, them that had sacrificed, excuse me, them that had sacrificed unto, unto them. And, the burnt, and he burnt the bones of the priest upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. If uh, the grooves in there translates over to uh, wooden images. They got in a time when they had images and they was looking at him more than they were God. So if you could number things that you looked at, things that you paid attention to, one through whatever, I don't care if it goes to a hundred, don't care if it goes to a thousand, what number would God fall in on? Would he be number one? Would he be middle ways? Would he be last? He should be number one. If you put God first, everything else will start falling into place. Everything else will start falling into place. He tore down. Uh, he tore down <clears throat> things that are more important than God. You should, too. How, how important is he to you? Is he the most important thing? Is he more important than your job? School? Fishing? Hunting? TV? The list can go on and on. How important is he? How much do you love him? Because, see... It's hard for us to realize how much God loved us. We can say, "Well, well, well yeah, I, I know He sent, you know, He sent His only Son." True. But how much do we love Him back? Do we love Him unconditionally, like He loves us? We should. I heard a pastor preaching a long time ago. He, he made the comment, and I'm going to use it because I know he won't care. Do you tell him you love him? You should. If you don't, he wants to hear it. He wants to see it. That we truly love him. And that means wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. I've done cover this, but I'm going to cover it a little bit more. He wants to know you. He wants that personal relationship with you. He wants, excuse me, I said know you. He, he wants you to know him. 
He wants you to know him in every way that you possibly can. I didn't look what scripture's up. It says if you'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Very true. Very true. I'm going to tell on my tail, just tell on myself just a little bit. About two or three weeks ago, four, I become bitter. Not really at nobody. Don't know why. So, the genius I am, and that's, that's, that's been used hypothetical. You can laugh about that because I'm no genius. On Tuesday morning, I got up and I said, my wife don't even know what I'm about to say. I said, God, I'm done with church. I'm walking away. Wednesday night rolled around. I didn't go. But man, about 11 o'clock on Thursday, you talking about God humbling somebody? And when he got done with me from to Friday morning, about 11 o'clock, I said, God, I promise you, I'll be in church Sunday morning. Let's say some wild ball reason that I cannot be there, I'll be there every time that I can. I'm not going to elaborate on it very much because I may put it all in a sermon sometime or another. Don't know if you'll ever get to hear it or not. But I can tell you right now, when I got done, I knew how Jonah felt been in the belly of that whale I didn't stay in there three days and thank God I didn't but he made me have a different outlook I hit on it there earlier I said talking about he uh he wants you to know him, and you can take this. And if you if you had it on your mind that well, you know he 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 uh he uh he needs to know me. Well, he does. You can re- reference that. I could have pulled it out of several different scriptures, but First John three uh, three twenty, for for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Sometimes we want to take things that we've done and we want to keep beating ourselves up for it. But the thing about it is, God knows our heart. People, revival starts with us. It starts with me. So here's what I'm going to say. Do you want revival? Do you want revival? Then here's what you're going to have to do. God has got to start with me. And you've got to place it in your heart. You want revival to come to this community? You want revival to come to this country? Then it's got to start somewhere. It's time for Christians to quit sitting on the pew and saying, let somebody else do it. Or they say, well, I can't do it by myself. But here's the thing about it is, if the church wants revival, let it start in each each individual person. And then when you come back to the church on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or even Sunday nights and you bring revival back to the church in your own heart, then the whole church gets revival. It's a chain link. Then, when 
I'm just using this. If this church gets revival, a church down the road says, man, what have they got going on? I want part of that. They come and they ask you, say, what y'all got going on at the church? Man, we had revival. And it got in each and every one of us. It set each and every one of us on fire. Then he takes it back or she takes it back, and then what happens? Their church gets it. And then the next thing you know, all churches have got it. The next thing you know, the whole country's got it. But here's the thing about it is, if you want change and you want revival, it's got to begin with you. I can preach about revival. Brother Aaron can preach about revival. We can pray for revival. But if it don't start in each and individual person's heart, revival's not going to come. Revival's not going to come. When we, when we look at things, we say, like I said earlier, well, let somebody else do it. I don't mean to upset anybody. There's a lot of people that come to this church, some before I even come, that I never knew that was the founders of this church. Why? Because God gave them a vision. There's a few of you been here since since kindly toward the beginning. Tammy, Miss B, maybe some of the others. I like I said earlier, I've probably been here for been coming 14 or 15 years. But let me tell you something. A lot of those people that was here, that was faithful door knockers, that worked the community, they're dead and gone. There's a song out that I like to hear, Me and God. Some of you may know it's kind of a country-based song. There's nothing that me and God can't do. There's nothing that you and God can't do. But there's also, there's also another song. Those people that's gone on, it's a country song. Which I'm sure a lot of you know it. I'm not going to call who sings it or anything. Who's going to fill their shoes? Who's going to fill their shoes? I was at a lady's funeral one time. Some of you's going to know who I'm talking about. Some of you won't. And like I said earlier, I don't mean to upset anybody. But a preacher that I think a lot of, he was doing her funeral. This lady was a pillar in his church. He said, I knew she prayed for me every day. That stuck with me. But he said, she's gone. He said, I knew that she prayed for me every day. He said, I could feel it. Even though she never told me, he said, I could feel it. He said, but who's going to take her place? Church, we've got a duty. And that's to share the love of Jesus Christ with every person that we can run across. We've got to love them. When we get people coming into the church, when we get people comes into the church houses, the church has got to show them love. We've got to take them in. We've got to put them under our wings, arms, whatever you want to call it, however you want to refer to that, because it's our duty. We should be just like Jesus Christ, and we should want to show people love. It's not about what I want, not about what anybody else wants. It's about what Jesus Christ has in store for the church. Not just this church, every church. I'm speaking as a church as a whole. But <clears throat> will it start with you? Will it start with you? We're fixing to go into a time of commitment. 
lot of you know I'm a firm believer of an altar call it's the reason altars is made I'm not saying that you can't pray in your pew if that's where you want to stay if that's where you want to, if that's where you want to stay at that's fine but I'm going to say one or two more things brother Buck I'm not even going to let him come and lead the music all I'm going to do is let Andy Lauren whoever's back there punching the button punch it and let it play is it going to start with you some of you may say I'm not able I'm not able to go out and go knocking on doors you got a telephone you can go to the store and you buy paper ink pens envelopes you send somebody a letter most of you's got computers or a telephone you can FaceTime somebody you say man that's gonna be weird they might hang up on me that's fine because when you start planting that seed here's the thing about it is we plant that seed we let God take over let God start convicting that person will it begin with you I got one more thing and I'm not going to get on it very much most of you know the passage that I'm talking about you do not even have to turn over there but I'm going to be reading now Luke chapter 17 talking about when Jesus healed the ten lepers I'm just going to read you the last let's see yeah the last three verses and Jesus answering saying were there not ten cleansed were the nine verse 17 there verse 18 there are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger and he said unto him arise go thy way thy faith has made thee whole you may be sitting here today and said well, he ain't made me whole I'm going to kind of have to disagree with you there because in the sense I'm talking about if you've accepted him as your personal savior you became whole. You're a joint heir to Christ. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. But my question is, are you the one that returned and give him glory? Or are you one of the nine? reason I told you I wasn't going to elaborate on that very much is just like I said there earlier I'm working on a scripture out of that that the Lord's laid on my heart I'm not going to give it away you may not never hear it are you the one are you one of the nine here's the thing about it is only you can answer that question if you want revival to start you want that change up to you I can't change you you may be here today and you may not know Jesus Christ as your personal savior they ain't a greater day you may say I've done too much wrong no you haven't because Jesus loves you brother Andy after I pray, will you start us? The invitation to be, if you want to come to the altar, the altar's open. If you want somebody to come and pray with you, come on. If you want, if you can grab somebody. If you want me to pray with you, it don't matter. I don't have to know what you're praying about. But I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, Andy will start the song. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the day you've given us once again. Lord, you know each and every one of the hearts here. And once again, Lord, 
I just pray that I get no honor and glory for anything said or done here today, Lord, and it's all lifted up to you. Lord, revival starts with each and every one of us. And, Lord, all I'm going to ask you to do is send the Holy Spirit, Lord, and touch each and every one that's here and let revival start here, that we'll step out in this community and we'll be a witness for you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.